Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sallallahu alayka ya Rasulallah. Wa ahli baytika al-mazlumin. Assalamu ala al-Husayn. Wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn. Wa ala adil Husayn. Wa ala ashab al-Husayn. Wa ya laytana kunna ma'akum. Sadati unafuza fawzan azima. I'm uh, grateful for the invitation and um, in many ways we live in rather strange times and I, I think the topic I chose was something which was um, quite salient to the times in which we live. It is rather unusual in these days of Muharram for us to be very much confined to our own homes. Uh, not least because the commemorations of uh, the martyrdom of Imam Hussain and his companions in Karbala usually um, brings forth people um, in large groups for communal gatherings and commemorations. And while of course we're seeing some of that happening in some parts of the world, with or without uh, social distancing, as the term is now being used. Um, I'm not sure about the United States, but certainly in Britain, um, there is hardly anything actually happening in Hussein years. At the same time, it's um, allowing us to connect virtually through things like Zoom with larger types of communities and very different and diverse kinds of communities. So in some ways, it's a, a blessing which allows us an opportunity to think about what our community is and those to whom we have a mutual bonds of attachment, regardless of where they live. Another element, of, perhaps, of that blessing is that, um, as you can see behind me, but in many other places, um, we have in effect turned our own houses and our own homes into Hosseinias. And so we are very much welcoming um, others to share in our commemoration. And of course, we are very much welcoming the Ahlul Bayt into our house, uh, our homes and, and houses. Now, in terms of the, the topic which I've chosen, um, as I said, I think it's, it's timely, but it's also a very obvious one because it connects three um, uh, things, three concepts, which are deeply interconnected. The first one, which of course is, is absolutely central to any notion of tashayyur, um, is the very idea of the walaya of the imam. The walaya of particular Imams, including, of course, Imam Hussain, but also the Walaya of the Ahlul Bayt more generally. And I'll come back to this question of what we understand by Walaya. Let me just say um, briefly that by Walaya, I mean both a status that the Ahlul Bayt hold, as well as um, something that we owe them through acts of recognition and devotion and attachment. So walaya in that sense is, is double faceted. It is both an intrinsic element of the Ahlul Bayt and is something which attaches us to them. The second element, of course, uh, which I put forward is ethics. Um, and ethics is um, something that pretty much everyone uh, is interested in. It doesn't matter whether your interests are um, explicitly philosophical or not, um, but ethics as ways in which we think about what we ought to do, how we ought to be, and very importantly, what we owe to each other is something which is very much central to our lives. Um, and it's an element of the praxis which relates to the more theoretical or principled elements of Walaya. 
So in one sense, you could say that walaya constitutes a particular knowledge or an ilm, and ethics constitutes an um, exteriorization of that, um, an amal, um, a praxis which derives from that. And this complementarity of um, ilm and amal is something, of course, you're all very familiar with. Um, I will say that before I continue, uh, much of what I will say, I'm sure will be very familiar to you um, in elements, perhaps not in precisely the way in which I'm putting everything together, but certainly many of the texts which I will mention and ideas I'm sure will be familiar to you. And I think one of the features of these nights, especially the first 10 nights, is acts of remembrance and remembrance to refresh remembrance to revive um, oneself and to reacquaint and reattach oneself to to reaffirm one's affiliation and um, uh, one's um, to use the classical language uh, one's covenant and also one's allegiance so um, if i say things which are familiar then it is not a surprise and um, in fact it's very much something which i uh, would like to aim at um, because it helps in communicating ideas and it helps in um, the easy kind of access and reception of what I'm trying to say. So coming back to the point about the complementarity between knowledge and praxis, uh, this is something which is extensively discussed of course in the Islamic traditions. There are many um, hadith on this. There is uh, extensive discussions in uh, Quranic um, passages but also in hadith about the complementarity between those who are the ulama and those who are the amilun, uh, those who act and those who know. And that, that complementarity has to be um, understood um, so much so that um, there is uh, discussions about um, uh, for example, if a person um, acts, it's, it's a hadith, if a person acts according to what he knows, then God um, increases within that person the complementarity of the two, and he further allows him to acquire further knowledge so that he can act even further upon it. And here, this is very much a sense that um, knowledge and uh, praxis is related in terms of uh, what is, in a sense, theoretical and what is practical. Uh, to use more philosophical language, in that sense, what we're talking about when we're trying to relate walaya, the imam, um, with uh, akhlaq, and I'll use the term akhlaq, and I'll come back to that in more detail for ethics, then what we're doing is we're relating what um, the philosophical tradition would call um, the hikmah nadariya, the theoretical wisdom, theoretical philosophy, theoretical intellect, to the practical, the hikmah amaliya. Now, of course, out of that arises this question of justice. And what I will do tomorrow is I will talk much more about how questions of justice arise, but I'll just give you a quick indicator at this point about how I see the connections arising. By justice in this context, I mean the term adala, uh, adalat, um, which of course will be very familiar to you. Um, in our days, I think there has been a lot of discussion about it. The political aspects of justice, people talk extensively about social justice. Um, for Of course, you're mainly um, sitting in North America and you cannot be unaware of what has been happening in recent times in which um, we are having a return of at least for some people and uh, a very public debate on social justice relating to issues around cultural difference relating to race relating to equity and uh, ways of dealing with the historical uh, past and so forth so the, the question of justice then 
certainly arises as uh, a demand, as a quest which many people have. And what I will want to discuss tomorrow is how that arises out of the two um, other entities and ideas I've mentioned. And in one sense, one could argue that justice or adalat arises out of the homology of the complete complementarity between the ilm and the amal, between the theory and the praxis. And that is very much um, a particular definition of um, adalat, adala, which is given in some of the akhlaq texts, uh, for example. I'm sure many of you will be fam familiar with Naraqi's uh, Jamia Sa'ada, uh, which is a very significant 18th century text, um, which remains um, highly studied. In many ways, a very traditional, broadly Aristotelian text. But in that, you have uh, precisely this kind of formulation in which justice is seen as the complete homology or the complete um, uh, sympathy, even the complete complementarity between a uh, theory and practice between ilm and amal. Now, today, what I want to do is I want to focus a bit more on uh, the question of uh, the walaya of the imam and particularly of ethics. And let me say something um, more on the ethics side um, before I come back to the relationship with walaya. Now, as I said before, um, ethics, we normally uh, consider ethics uh, in the way in which people talk about it as um, what we ought to do. And certainly a lot of modern ethics is considered uh, concerned with questions of um, action. Um, why do we act in particular ways? How ought we to act? Do we have particular warrants for ways in which we act? Um, and it's extensively focused on, as I said, the agency of the person. A lot of um, the history of ethics, of course, is considered, uh, concerns, does concern acts and does concern how we evaluate acts, but is, is perhaps less concerned with the act in and of itself and more concerned with how actions arise from a particular state. And um, those states relate to the sort of person you are. So they arise out of your moral psychology and the sorts of um, traits and characteristic, the characteristics that you have inculcated within yourself. So agency then arises out of the sort of person you are. And so a lot of this um, tradition of ethics, which is usually called virtue ethics, and which is prevalent, um, especially in certain religious contexts, whether they are Islamic or other Abrahamic contexts, as well as other religious contexts. Um, and it becomes very much um, a focal element. And even within um, modern um, philosophical, contemporary philosophical discussions on ethics and meta-ethics, one can see very much the revival of virtue ethics and the revival of a, a concern with the question of character, of character, of the properties and characteristics that a person may have. Now, um, there are other elements of um, ethics uh, which, which arise, which um, I'll mention briefly before I go back into what uh, the tradition of akhlaq is. And this relates to this wider scope of what is usually called affect theory. Um, I'm sure a number of you use these concepts. Uh, we talk about um, uh, affect, we talk about the effective, we talk about things like effective communities and agency. And here we're talking about a whole range of experiences and cognitive and even precognitive states that people may have. Um, there are other terms which are very similar to affect, such as emotion, such as mood and temperament, which people talk about. Uh, but in, in many ways, affect is a much larger category. 
And what uh, it uh, does is it relates to certain questions about how we can perhaps be motivated to, towards moral agency, uh, motivated to doing what we ought to do and understanding uh, uh, actions and evaluating them as, as good and, um, and, and godly even um, insofar as one's talking about uh, religious ethics. Um, and uh, affect, uh, of course, relates to various elements of experience, which is very much embedded in culture. So one of the important elements there of affect is literature and the arts. And again, I will come back to this particular um, question of literature uh, in, a f in a few moments, quite simply because, as we all know, um, the vast majority of people are not necessarily inclined to thinking about ethics purely in the abstract. Of course, there are people who are philosophically inclined, who are perfectly happy doing it and, and are happy engaging in uh, thought experiments and rather abstract considerations of, uh, for example, what do we understand by justice? What is good? In what sense can we say that um, killing another person or imposing upon another person is wrong? Um, to what extent can we say torts are always wrong and so forth? But usually the way in which we learn about what it is right to do and what we ought not to do and what sort of person we ought to be and what sort of uh, qualities we want to, virtues we want to acquire and inculcate within ourselves so that the actions can arise from it. Um, usually when we're talking about such things, we refer to um, things such as um, ideas such as moral exemplars, um, you know, certain uh, figures for who are uh, exemplary for us who show us the way and show us how to do things. And of course, in the um, Islamic traditions, we're talking about the prophet, we're talking about prior prophets, and we're talking um, especially about um, the imams and the Ahlul Bayt um, and uh, their followers and their close um, companions as well. Precisely because it is by seeing those examples that we have a sense of what is right to do in certain contexts and how we can perhaps emulate uh, them. And we know this, of course, because of the way in which um, both Quranic material and also Hadith material present these figures as examples. So we have uh, the Quran referring to um, the Prophet as being of the greatest character, Khulq al is the term used for being a, a perfect exemplar or good example for you to follow. Um, um, the notion of the uswa, the uswa hasana there in this context uh, is quite important. Alongside that, you have the sense that recognizing and following the prophet and the imams is one way in which we can inculcate within ourselves the sorts of akhlaq to become better people who will then do what is good. And this is indicated in the very famous um, hadith, uh, which again, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, if not all of you, uh, which is uh, when the prophet um, early in his mission says, um, I have been sent, I have been given this mission to perfect um, for you or perfect um, the the best of um, virtues, best of characteristics, um, the best of characters. And so the, the very central um, mission, in a sense, of the faith, the very central call, the kerygma, is to inculcate within oneself um, a certain type of character. And this is indicated in many other kinds of sayings. Uh, another saying which is often considered to be hadith, a very popular among Sufis, the khalaqu bi akhlaqillah, which is then associating those characteristics with uh, 
the uh, the ability of these moral exemplars to exemplify uh, divine properties, divine attributes. Um, so by following the prophet, one is trying to inculcate one within oneself the virtues of the divine. And these are precisely things like um, mercy, things like generosity, um, things like love and compassion and um, being helpful and so forth kind um, and so forth. So uh, there is much already within the tradition which propels you in that particular kind of direction um, with respect um, to uh, character. Now the I want to come back to this um, question of um, narratives so uh, as i said one element of the way in which um, we often successfully uh, talk about and try and inculcate ethical um, values and virtues is through uh, considering a moral example and an exemplar and then emulating them but an associated associated element of that is how do we access that moral exemplar. And one does that through narratives, one does that through stories, one does that through literary texts, by reading, by absorbing, by hearing literary texts. And also a, a strong element of that is um, not just engaging with prose, but of course with poetry. Um, again, uh, I, I suspect the vast majority, if not all of you, are Iranian. Um, and so you will be familiar with the way in which over the centuries in Persian and Persianate culture, certain works of prose and poetry had um, a privileged status as a form of uh, presenting narratives, explaining what the human condition was, and that people read and engaged with these texts so they could inculcate within themselves a sense of what it meant to be human so that they could allow their selfhood, their sense of person to arise. And, um, you know, the famous texts, again, will be very familiar to you. Um, the works of uh, Saadi, uh, the Gulistan and the Bostan, um, works such as uh, the well, the collection of, of Ghazals in the Divan Hafez, and many other works, the, the, the famous extensive Masnavis and um, uh, epic poems, or whether it's um, um, Layli or Majnu, Yusuf or Zalecha, uh, these, these romances which are very much about the quest for reality, quest for the path of love um, towards the divine, uh, which presents certain um, moral types um, who, uh, in a sense, are there to be emulated, but also in certain cases, um, not to be emulated. So this act of narrative, of storytelling, is absolutely central to the way in which we um, attach ourselves to um, ethical norms, ethical values. Now, one other example of this, um, a famous one, which again, you will be very familiar with, um, is a text which I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, and um, unfortunately, it's, it's a text which many people do not really read or engage with, despite the fact that the central narratives in these days in Muharram, um, which actually gives rise, as I'm sure you all know, to the ritual that is known as Rose Khuni, um, uh, it, it's a neglected text. And of course, I'm talking about the Rose the Shahada of uh, Hussein Barzai Kashifi. Now, if one looks at the Rose the Shahada, as a text which is very neatly divided up into 10 chapters. And of course, the traditional idea was that different chapters would be read in different sittings. And so you get the development of um, 
maqtal and roze khuni divided up into 10 dah majalis as a genre uh, being associated with that now the fundamental uh, message perhaps of the Raza of the Shahada is an ethical one. It's basically saying, look at these figures, look at the prophets of the past, look at our prophet, look at um, the family of the prophet, and then look particularly at the example of Imam Hussein and his band of followers on their path towards Karbala and their, fight and their martyrdom. And then, of course, what happens to their families after the day of Ashura. And look at how they deal with the, look at how they deal um, with the Bala, right? So one of the, the fundamental features of um, the path or the human condition, and especially those who got favors, is bala, right? Which we often translate as a trial or an affliction. And of course, um, trials and afflictions can be both positive and negative. So um, it is a bala to be given great wealth and great um, gifts and boons by God. And it's also um, a bala to be afflicted with poverty and with deprivation and with hunger and so forth. But especially it is the greatest bala is precisely the negative one, the one of deprivation. And so as uh, Kashifi says in the text himself, particularly in the introduction and in other parts of the text, you know, let's look at the ways in which the prophets and the awliya were mubtala, right? Look at the way in which they were and how did they behave in the face of that? Now that's an absolutely essential, essential question of trying to derive um, ethical norms and examples from this narrative of Karbala is precisely to look at um, the way in which the dealing with that Bala um, was uh, presented in the text. And also uh, there's important aesthetic elements of that. So the reason why the Rose of the Shahada is written in, in very elegant but rather simple Persian prose. The reason why um, various other accounts which relate to Imam Hussein and Karbala are given in uh, beautiful prose or poetry is that the aesthetic element of it, the affective element of those texts is extremely significant for the way in which it has an impact upon the reader, the listener. And it's that sort of, um, the whole sensory um, experience of that, which is extremely important, uh, particularly the way in which one listens to it. Um, uh, another example of a, um, uh, a, a Persian prose text, which does this wonderfully and has a wonderful aesthetic sense is this Qadar text, um, Faiz ad um, which uh, was published around uh, 20 years ago by Mirasi Maktoub in, in, in Tehran. Uh, and that again uh, does very similar things. It's very neatly presented as different steps upon a, a longer journey. And um, it shows you how the friends of God dealt with the, the afflictions and it does it in an aesthetic manner which helps you to appreciate and receive what is being said more. If you say something perhaps a bit difficult in nice ways, it's much easier for someone to um, accept it than in, uh, for other people. And of course, um, perhaps in, in many ways, the way I'm delivering this is not wonderful. Um, I've often been said, I, I often had it said to me that my voice is somewhat soporific, uh, so I hope you're not falling asleep. It's quite late here. It's not as late there. But um, certainly the way in which a message is delivered is an extremely important element of the way in which it would also be received. In the light of that, one thing which uh, perhaps I should also mention is um, 
if you're interested more in this relationship between ethics and narrative and storytelling, um, you can of course read the classics, the text which I've mentioned already, but a work which does this wonderfully well in recent uh, years, uh, which came out a few years ago, is this work um, by uh, my friend um, Cyrus Zargar called uh, Polishing the Mirror, which is a wonderful study of how it is that in different um, genres of Islamic learning, the question of ethics is brought up and how it relates to this wider notion of uh, storytelling and of narrative as a vehicle for expressing this. Okay, now, um, moving uh, beyond uh, the, uh, the narrative. Um, and uh, again, I, I didn't mention this before, but it's, it's worth mentioning that um, this, this notion of narrative as a vehicle for teaching, teaching both theoretical and uh, matters of faith, but also uh, matters of ethics, is very much expressed in um, in Quranic narratives and uh, the notion of the the qisla, um, both in the Quran, of course, and in the stories of the prophets, right? the qisas al anbiya genre, which is um, extremely significant. And when you look at those um, genres of uh, those elements of kind of scriptural, uh, which have scriptural authority. Uh, that also shows you the absolute central significance of narratives. Um, you know, the, the famous story of, of Joseph, which the Quran describes as the best, the best, the most beautiful, um, the, um, the most elaborate of stories. Um, now, it's a particular story of a journey, um, a coming to, um, uh, coming to reason, um, a, a growing up of a particular individual, but it says a lot about society, it says a lot about interpersonal relationships, it says a lot about relationships within families, it says a lot about vices of things such as jealousy and envy and, um, and other vices such as um, lust and greed and so forth. So there are many, many elements of that. And then of course you have the positive virtues which are presented in the story of Joseph as well, such as knowledge, such as generosity, such as um, this term, um, uh, Isar, um, which I always find very different, difficult to uh, translate into English. Um, altruism never really so sounds very accurate to me, but Isar, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the concept of Isar. And so you have um, this idea of the relationship between ethics and um, narrative, which is very much there also in the Quran. Now, coming back to this relationship between the, the knowledge and the praxis, um, or um, the, the ilm and the amal, um, it brings us back to this question of uh, virtue ethics and it brings us back to uh, this fundamental question of how it is that we relate uh, the certain properties of walaya of the Ahlul Bayt and of the Imams as they're given to us and uh, what we owe to them. So as I mentioned before walaya has two elements. Walaya is a certain uh, status that the Ahlul Bayt have and it is also a recognition or um, a set of uh, affections in a sense that we owe to them. And uh, within uh, this context, um, one can talk about, um, it's useful probably to talk, uh, to start talking about uh, elements of the former before we talk about um, the latter. So, um, if you pick up um, any um, fairly standard um, work of hadith on questions about um, 
faith and uh, the sort of the questions around Iman and the sort of the usul as you find it in Al-Kafi or um, works such as the Basai Darajat of uh, Safar Al-Qummi then you encounter various elements of what we understand by Walaya and what the features of that are and the status that the al bayt have. So the first point uh, to, to uh, mention here is um, the emphasis on the very notion of Walaya. Now you get this both in um, Ifnashari texts and also you get it in Ismaili texts. Um, in fact, you could argue even in Ismaili texts, um, the question of Walaya is, is emphasized perhaps even more so. So if you look at a work such as Al-Qadi Nu'man's um, Da'im al-Islam uh, from the 10th century, then uh, Da'im of course is well known for being uh, pretty much, um, I guess what we would nowadays call a, a fiqh manual, um, but it has certain theological uh, premises and one of the significant theological premises, of course, is Walaya. And within that, you have um, these uh, reports, uh, which are common to the Ismaili and the Ifnashari traditions, um, usually from Imam Baqir salam about um, how you know Islam is, is built upon five things, or Islam is built upon seven things, and the most significant of these is Walaya. So that raises already the question of, well, what do we mean by walaya? And if it is so important that it constitutes the foundation, so in a sense, it is that without which the prayer, the fasting, the pilgrimage and so forth, uh, in a sense, ha are, are devoid of meaning, uh, then we need to understand what we mean by walaya. And so that's where you get into the question of um, specific definitions. So at one level, walaya is this notion of the intimacy, um, the, the friends, the friendship of God. So these are the individuals who are chosen to be the intimates of God and their friends. One often talks, for example, of the example of, uh, for example, Abraham. Abraham, who is described as the Khalil, as someone who has intimacy with the divine, is given that particular kind of rank. And that rank is then associated with this notion of walaya. But above and beyond that um, simple definition where we're talking about uh, walaya literally means a proximity or being next to, um, or even mediating in a sense between two close things. Um, then we have the other features of it. So when we look in these chapters on Walaya or look in these chapters on the status of the Ahlul Bayt, we find notions around, uh, for example, special knowledge of Ilm. And this relates um, not just to the simple features of what is um, permissible, permissible and what is prohibited, but also a, a wider understanding of of the metaphysics of reality and also understanding that even when we are talking about questions of what is permissible and what is impermissible then we're fundamentally talking about an ethical frame way of life that's that's why one needs to understand the nature of ritual practice things which ought to be done and things which ought to be foregone quite simply so that we can fulfill our ethical and moral obligations and of course, the moral obligations, theologically speaking, as we know, go back to the, um, the initial point, so to speak, the initial rational point of belief, um, which is articulated, for example, in the Kalam traditions, that um, if we uh, accept that there is a God and there is a creator and a sustainer of the cosmos, and at some point there will be a requital and a meeting uh, with that principle, then we take on a certain moral obligation, which is known as taklif. And it is precisely the role of prophets and then their successors uh, in the form of the Ahlul Bayt uh, 
to help us to fulfill what those moral obligations are. So a very important element of the special knowledge that the Imams have is that they can help us, they can teach us uh, ways in which we can fulfill those moral obligations. They can guide us, they can act as a manifestation of um, divine grace, of lutf, so that we can fulfill that particular kind of moral obligation that we have. And the reason, of course, why, which I should have mentioned before, I apologize, why we have the moral obligation is precisely because once you have recognized that there is a creator and a sustainer and there will be a requital, then one uh, recognizes that one exists and one has been given the gift of existence and so one has to reciprocate by thanking someone who has given you a gift and that process of thanking someone the benefactor as it's called in kalam language uh, shukr al-mun'im is through the taking on of taklif of moral obligation there are various other sorts of things that the uh, the imams as the bearers of Walaya have. Um, they are um, the privileged uh, friends of God. Uh, they are inheritors of knowledge of the past and of the future. Um, they are the proofs of God on earth. They are the hujjah. Uh, and so that they manifest the divine attributes so we can understand what God is in a indirect manner because we can never have an, a direct experience of the very reality of the divine, but we can have an experience of the manifestation of that, uh, which is why there has to be a hujja, who is um, a proof of God, but also a proof over us um, through the course of our lives and into the hereafter. And there's very various other elements. Again, a lot of these elements you will already be familiar with. So let me move on to the, the responses. As I said, um, there are extensive discussions about then what do we then owe back? And the reason why I put it in those terms is precisely because that is the way in which I think uh, one of the helpful strands of contemporary ethics works, which is to understand ethics as what we owe one another. So what is it that we owe as our expression of, of walaya um, to the Ahlul Bayt? In the first instance, it is recognition. And this is extensively discussed in so many different texts, is recognition that they are the awliya, that they are the hujaj Allah. Um, and that recognition then allows our moral agency, our understanding and evaluation of actions to acquire meaning. And the way then we then act upon that recognition is to then become, in a sense, their students. One of the very important, and this again refer, refers back to this connection between ilm and amal, if you know, if you recognize someone as being knowledgeable and being a moral exemplar, then it makes sense to agree to or to consider that it's sensible um, to become their students or to take on their teaching or to seek to learn uh, from them and to seek to learn in particular how they, um, they treat people and then try and apply that in your own lives. And the third element of uh, the walaya that we owe uh, to the Ahlul Bayt um, is this uh, notion of our own mutuality, right? So one of the ways in which we reflect um, our recognition of the Imams and our um, in a sense, surrendering our, our learning to them is then to recognize that we have bonds of mutuality and we owe our fellow uh, believers, our fellow Ahle Valayat, certain things. Um, 
uh, whether that's through sort of mutual help, compassion, uh, love, um, charity, and so forth. Now, of course, in many ways, we owe these sorts of bonds to our fellow humans anyway. But it's more a recognition that there are, uh, there is a certain privilege that the other Ahl al-Walayat have. Um, you know, as I said, the, the, the relationship between the, the Walaya of the Imams and ethics as um, ways in which we ought to live and ought to be um, and what we owe one another um, is articulated precisely in understanding the status that the Walaya um, entails of the Imams and then what we owe to them with respect to our Walaya um, and particularly these, these three examples I gave of recognition of um, learning from them and of uh, what we owe uh, one another. Now, as I said, um, what I, I intend to do tomorrow is um, to continue um, with this, to discuss this question of Adalat, uh, of Adala and justice and to see how that emerges from that. Um, I think I should stop here just because um, it's uh, been about 45 minutes or so and I don't know about um, you but um, in some ways I'm zoomed out um, and uh, you know the shorter in a sense the better there will be obviously there will be time for discussion any questions that people have um, but I, I, I think I will um, I will stop at this point uh, and then I will continue with the discussion tomorrow. Thank you. So thank you so much. So you prefer to have the questions and answers tomorrow and not, not to, tonight? Um, we, can, we can do the Q&A relating to today um, if you want, but if there's anything about the implications on justice, then we can take that tomorrow. Uh, if, so, so if there is a question about justice, I should yeah, ask, we'll, but if there's a question about the yeah, ethics, we'll leave that for tomorrow. Yeah, sure. uh, the ethics, I can go forward and ask like one or two questions. Sure, please go ahead. Okay, so one question the person asked about the, the Vulaya of the Imams, or like the Prophet and the Imams that you mentioned, is it uh, you have in mind both the Vulaya of Tashri and Takwini together? Or it's more like of Tashri? So you brought up like the concept of Ilm of the knowledge of the Imams? Yeah. Talked about like the, or the, the Takwini parts, uh, the sense of uh, do they have the I don't know, like the person what they done. Well, I guess they're like, you know, the Velayat of Tashri and Taikmini. Uh, yes. Do you have both yeah. in mind? Yes, I do. Uh, I, in fact, um, I mean, the, most of the sorts of texts which I'm talking about, which which discuss the elements of the Walaya, um, uh, particularly in the early Hadith um, compilations such as Al-Kafi and um, Basara Dajjad are are very much within the mode of what, certainly in the last, say, 150 odd years, has been known as um, uh, Walaya Taqwiniya. So that, I think, is, is certainly the case. The question of, of whether that on, constitutes um, emulation um, uh, is an interesting question, quite simply because um, of the question of, well, what sort of limits do we have in in our ability to act in certain ways, right? So um, it's quite possible that the, in the, the whole range of uh, Walaya Taqwiniya, um, that is not entirely um, open to everyone. Um, and also I think it's because, um, I mean, this is again where the philosophical tradition comes in. You have this notion of uh, walaya and even Walaya Taqwinia as being uh, fundamentally graded. So uh, a sort of a gradational modulated reality. Um, it undergoes, um, you know, what's known as tashkik um, uh, in, um, in the philosophical uh, tradition. Uh, so there are different levels and degrees to which uh, people, uh, within which people can work. Um, and, and this is something which um, again in the in the Irfan traditions is discussed quite extensively um, particularly within the context of um, you know these commentaries on the um, the uh, the Fususul Hikam particularly the chapter on Seth uh, so you have these commentaries by people like um, 
uh, Mohamed Zakum Jahi and others in the 19th century, which discuss precisely the way in which Walai works, different elements of it, what implications that has, has for our own spirituality and our practice, and how it is that, um, you know, we, uh, we in a sense, uh, function within this wider reality of Walai, which has different degrees, and the Imams have certain degrees, and we have degrees, and, and other people have degrees, and so forth. Thank you so much. Another question is, uh, is ethical behavior absolute or relative? For example, is there any possibility that Yazid and his crew were acting out of a sense of ethical obligation of maintaining the unity of the Muslim Ummah, or were they completely devo devoid of the ethics? So, um, I mean, that raises an interesting question, which is that... Um, well, it raises the question of, of, of context and consequence, right? So, um, they, or even of, of utility. So, you know, one could argue that the unity of uh, the community is a greater good. Um, one could uh, uh, certainly say that. One could talk about um, uh, an act being good because it con its consequences seem to be good. Um, but... I don't think that's necessarily always the way in which um, uh, these things are presented. Um, it's not necessarily to say that um, uh, that the Islamic traditions are completely, you know, as the term is, deontological, in the sense that um, uh, things are, in a sense, very absolute. But rather there is... Um, one way in which we can understand this through the this idea of moral example is by looking at um, you know what's known as um, uh, typology. Um, so this is where you look at types and anti-types in um, in scriptural and in historical texts. Um, so you know classically you have uh, things like, um, uh, for example, you have Moses and Pharaoh. Um, you have, of course. Um, Abraham and, and, and Nimrod. Um, you have, of course, the Prophet and Abu Sufyan and so forth, um, Ali and Muawiyah, uh, Hossein and Yazid. And what you do is um, you kind of map these types and anti-types against each other and you get a sense of which, um, what constitutes a positive character and what constitutes a negative character. So uh, certainly within that context, um, it's really, I mean, certainly in, in the Karbala context, it's very difficult to see ways in which one can exonerate certain individuals. Um, the only types of exonerations which are usually made, which may seem plausible um, in a very narrow context, would be, for example, not being aware of what was going on, right? Um, but... Um, again, if you look at the wider picture, if you look at everything from the demand for bay'ah all the way through the treatment of the family and beyond, it's very, very difficult to see whether um, this is um, acting, um, is const constitutes a good action, um, constitutes the good, which has a good effect. I mean, certainly in terms of consequence, it did not have a good effect. Thank you so much. Another question is, is ethics only based, in your view, only based on religion or more specifically on Bulaya? Or you can imagine ethics beyond Bulaya or beyond religion? Um, I, so this is an important question, whether um, um, ethics beyond, um, not just beyond religion, but beyond one's particular confession is possible. Um, Insofar as ethics concerns the, the quest to do what is uh, good and uh, the quest to understand what it is that we owe one another, then I do not see why others cannot um, do so. Um, and uh, certainly, um, I, I think the, the traditions that we have allow for the possibility of others to act, um, to display um, uh, good um, virtues and uh, moral characteristics within themselves and to have a positive impact upon themselves and those around them and even of course to have um, a positive and uh, flourishing um, afterlife because of course one of the elements of the, you know the reasons why it's important um, 
to to live the the ethical life is because that has implications for the afterlife if you have a good ethical life here you have a good ethical life uh, in the afterlife so it allows for um, a more pluralistic reading of the nature of reality and i think that's that's perfectly reasonable um, the the difference there is is not so much whether there are other possible paths the question then i think becomes one of of efficacy and understanding and then finding ways in which you can map that elsewhere um, I, I certainly think there are other traditions who have similar notions of um, walaya what we would call walaya they would have other notions which are cognate to that um, the question of whether uh, that arises for someone who literally believes in nothing is a slightly more difficult one because it's in sort of a question of trying to make sense of well um, uh, what sort of person is that is that a just a pure materialist um, or physicalist um, uh, how do they see the nature of life how do they see the question of giving value to life because of course um, one of the elements of ethics which is quite significant is that you find a way in which you give value to life you give meaning and and my argument is certainly within the Shi tradition that that very much comes out of walaya um, so the quite i think the question of 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 some sort of pure atheist or materialist is a slightly different one in in case of other religious traditions i don't think there's a at all a, a problem of of the possibility of of moral agency thank you so much i do the best question that you can have a quick answer uh, this could we see could we believe that the Balaya, could could we see that believe in Balaya, uh as a moderation in ethical act and being more cautious before acting in other words believing the Valaya makes a muslim more moderate like ethically moderate i mean the, the the word moderate is really problematic um uh, i i kind of know you know that there's ways in which it kind of is a very normal thing because there's so much in the the ethical tradition um and uh, even the Aristotelian tradition, which talks about moderation as like a mean between extremes and so forth. Um, uh, I don't know about you and the, the American context, but uh, when one normally talks about the word moderate in the British context, it has a very political flavor. Um, you know, so a, a moderate or a Muslim or Shi acting moderate is basically someone who is not violent, who is very... Um, um, accepting very passive of a particular political order and so forth and um in that sense um i'm not sure the word moderate necessarily applies if if by moderate or moderation one means the idea of being cautious and of being uh, very much aware of what one owes to one's fellow person and that you try to keep the uh, the welfare and the desires and the the needs of the other person absolutely paramount in the way in which you behave and and live your life then absolutely i think well i definitely requires that um you know it requires you to act to with your fellow in a particular way to give that person preference above and beyond yourself but also within the the set of choices that we have in life you know as i mentioned before you know god puts forward these choices that are mentioned in the quran of being either grateful or ungrateful then even within that it often says uh, in in various places where it's where there it's in sort of dahar or sort of fajr that um when you're when you're doing this you know consider those around you who um are have less consider those who are poor consider the orphans and don't just consider those who have that sort of i guess material poverty but also those who have um who have other kinds of deprivation right so we see people around us 
who have, um, for example, mental health issues. We have people around us who have, who suffer from other types of discrimination and disadvantage. And we should be actively engaged in helping um, better their position and better their situation. Um, that is, I think, precisely what um, attaching oneself to the Walaya of the Ahlul Bayt demands of us.